Hey, good morning. Scott Luton, Enrique Alvarez, and Kevin Brown here, here with you on Supply Chain. Now, welcome to today's episode. Kevin, Enrique, how are we doing? Hey, uh, good morning. How are you today? I'm doing great, Scott. Thanks for asking. Always yeah. a pleasure to be here with you and our amazing guest today. Agree. One of our favorite series. Uh, beyond uh, great people like uh, Kevin and Enrique, I love this content. Logistics with Purpose is what this episode is all about. We're continuing that series here, powered by our dear friends over at Vector Global Logistics. And on this series, as we've talked about before, we spotlight leaders and organizations that are changing the world in some way, shape, or form. And, and we got to get those stories out. So wonderful conversation in store today. Hey, quick programming note before we get started here. If you like this conversation, be sure to venture over to Supply Chain Now, wherever you get your podcast from, and subscribe for free so you don't miss future episodes. Okay, we have an outstanding featured guest here today. He and his organization are doing huge things. He leads Good 360, where doing good is their mission. How does that fall right into this Logistics with Purpose series? 37 years of purposeful giving. We're going to talk more about that, helping to get the right product to the right people at the right time. Get ready. More than $10 billion of product has been distributed over the course of those 37 years to families in need. So no further ado, join me in welcoming Matt Connolly, CEO of Good360. Matt, how you doing? Doing well, Scott. Thanks for having me here this afternoon. And good to see you, Enrique and Kevin. Good to see you, Matt. Welcome you to too. the show. So we've got an outstanding conversation teed up. I, we love to talk with organizations that are moving the needle, much like Good360 is, and we got so much to dive into. But first... Before we get to the heavy lifting, Matt, uh, I want to dive into your background a little bit. So tell us, give us the goods on your upbringing. Where, where, where did you grow up? And give us an anecdote or two about, about that upbringing. Oh, um, I, I grew up in a, a town called Needham, Massachusetts, which is uh, right outside the Boston area. Uh, I went to university in Boston at uh, Northeastern University, right in Copley Square, Roxbury area, and uh, I had a... Uh, uh, rich, rich childhood with uh, lots of uh, good food and character and uh, uh, sports history. Not all of it good, but it has been good lately. Hey, you know, the bad years make the good years even better. And as a uh, longtime Clemson and Atlanta Braves fan, many, many of those years suffering fan, it makes it, it's made those good years even better. So let's, uh, so you mentioned food, you know, so you relocated to the Atlanta area from the Boston area. What's one thing you miss about living in a great city like Boston? Yeah, well, I, I think probably two things. I miss the uh, uh, local sports broadcast, uh, um, Nesson, New England Sports Network. I'm able to get that because I get the uh, the extra innings package and the center ice package for the Bruins, but uh, you, you don't get the, uh, you know, the between game programming I miss. And I also uh, uh, miss the, the seafood up there. It's pretty unique. Uh, uh, the, the folks up there call them steam steamers, which are steamed clams, and uh, you know, lot of Maine lobster is uh, is certainly something that uh, is is a little is very abundant uh, up in that area, as you know, Scott. So I miss those two things, and and uh, the good news is, is I got a plenty of reasons to go back. My uh, oldest son uh, works in Boston. He works for an investment bank in town, and uh, and, and my mother, uh, thank goodness, is. Uh, is thriving and, and through, through a pandemic and, and is up there. So I'm looking forward to visiting more here once the uh, pandemic settles down. Love it. Okay. Uh, so much Boston. I mean, we love Atlanta here, right? Of course we're partial. We love, love the city of Atlanta, but Boston also so much history and good food and, and just a, a great uh, global community. Uh, one more question, the billion dollar question for you, Matt, are you ready? Um, you mentioned the sports. Clearly, you're a, a passionate sports fan. What is your, uh, out of all the teams, what's the number one team that you're most passionate about? Red Sox. Okay. The Boston Red Sox, winner of what, two World Series in the last 10 years or so, right? Uh, four. Four. Holy cow. Where was I <laughs> those couple, couple of years? Um, well, incredible teams, incredible talent. And they're going through a little bit of a rebuild, uh, and it'd be fascinating to see kind of this, if we can have a normal baseball season, this in, in 2021, I think I read here lately that the brave the Atlanta Braves are hoping for full capacity in their stadium by June. So I love that kind of optimistic view. That means the vaccine is uh, the distribution has gone really well, and we can hopefully have some semblance 
of a normal baseball season. But man, the Red Sox have really, they've been the model uh, here recently, haven't they? Well, yeah, I don't know, uh, but I think you're very kind. I, I think the uh, the more the, the models that I think are uh, you know get my kudos is is the Tampa Bay Rays, uh, uh, where they can field a World Series caliber team and came up just short, right? And they, they, if they you can argue if they left in their starting pitcher a little longer, they they would have they would have won a World Series uh, with doing it with a, a fraction of the budget that you know the Dodgers have, the Red Sox have, and the Yankees have, but uh, uh, um, you know, the Red Sox, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, have had recent success, but they've also had a, uh, a very long drought, as you know, you know, with the curse. And, and uh, also, uh, I do uh, appreciate the Braves organization greatly. And I think uh, Truist Park, yes, what they call SunTrust now, is a, is a fantastic family venue down in Battery Park. Uh, incredibly well done. Agreed. And hopefully, um, uh, you know, I gotta, I gotta say, you know, the, the streak as we call it with the Atlanta Braves, 14 years of, of having won the pennant, but one world series versus four world series in the recent history with, with the Boston Red Sox. So we're really jealous here, We've got, but the Braves do have a great team. We'll see what happens in 2021. And I'll tell you, Kevin and Enrique, we could talk about this till the cows come home. Clearly <laughs> Matt is passionate about the Red Sox. I love that. Okay. So Enrique, I want to pass baton as we kind of move from, uh, you know, kind of the fun stuff with Matt into more of the, um, you know, leadership and industry. And then, and then eventually we'll get the good 360 with Kevin's help. But Enrique, where are we going next? Yes. No, thank you again, Scott. And again, Matt, thank you for being here. It's uh, it's, it's super, it's very refreshing to kind of be talking to uh, people like yourself and organizations like yours that are really kind of in the leading the uh, transformation, I would say when it comes to like purpose driven uh, companies and, and mentality. So thank you once again, I'm, it's going to be interesting. So there's a lot of uh, younger listeners that we have. And, and so if you could kind of walk us through from the very early uh, s- stages in your professional, very impressive professional transportation supply chain career. I mean, what are some of the things that you would kind of recall back in those days and kind of why, why logistics, right? Why logistics? How did you end up where you are now and being uh, such a successful uh, CEO? Well, Enrique, you and I are are students of this space and, and been in this space for a long time. And, uh, you know, it wasn't always a, a sexy uh, part of a uh, part of business, right? It was, uh, you know, warehousing or traffic management, it was called well before right. logistics and supply chain. And, and uh, I think one thing that people came to realize uh, j- just about this time last year, you know, how important supply chains are uh, um, that uh, supply chains are, uh, uh, are complex. Uh, so supply chains are sometimes fragile, uh, uh, but su- supply chains are always very important. And I think people uh, saw that last year where supply chains uh, experienced disruption in, in Q2. Um, I think another, you know, macro factors that has made supply chain really a cool and relevant space is, uh, you know, is the triangulation of, you know, three things, one being the growth of e-commerce, uh, the second being globalization. You know, the world has uh, become a smaller place. And the third is, is uh, big data, big, big analytics. And, and when you mesh all those three together, uh, it really comes uh, an area of importance. I think most companies, you know, when we were starting out, Enrique, the l- supply chain person uh, didn't have a seat at the, at the C-suite. Right, right. You know, they, yeah, they, 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 they don't. They, they might have been buried, you know, two and sometimes three, maybe levels below, uh, uh, and uh, you know, just, you know, the back office warehouse person, right? And uh, the necessary evil, maybe uh, yeah. earlier in yeah. those days, right? Yep. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the the uh, the understanding now, you know, and, and again, I mentioned big data, big analytics, and globalization. Um, you know, decisions that are made around or the strategic decisions that are made around a company's supply chain or approach to logistics is, is a, is a major differential or a make or break for a company. And, uh, you know, that's been pretty cool to, to, to see, uh, when I started 32 years ago in in Boston as a, uh, as a truck driver to have the, uh, the Boston accent come out, uh, I was, uh, fortunate to kind of learn the business from the ground up. and, And that was, driving a truck. And uh, I, I know exactly 
what the psyche is of the people that really matter. Um, you know, people in, in the office don't matter. I learned that right. at UPS. our brand is, is a person that is uh, driving safely and compliantly in our neighborhoods and, and, uh, and uh, delivering goods and goods and, uh, and needed goods, medicine, you know, uh, et cetera, to uh, people's doorstep, right? And those people are the brand. And uh, how I started with the business at UPS really gave me a, a granular understanding of that that uh, still sticks with me today. And then, um, you know, having the opportunity to work for a large company that had aspirations and the aspirations were uh, going from being a domestic small package provider to being a global multimodal supply chain company. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to learn uh, um, at a granular level, you know, different capabilities that you're very familiar with, Enrique, is ocean freight, air freight, uh, customs, brokerage, clearance, uh, uh, and uh, really, uh, you know, understanding uh, the importance of that as globalization really took off, you know, probably in the mid to late 90s and, and certainly accelerated in the, in, in the early 2000s. And, um, you know, those experiences really helped uh, for me to uh, get a good, strong understanding of how to right. put together networks that, uh, that, that uh, add value to companies and add value to consumers. Yeah, you were basically um, doing all the heavy lifting and you kind of went through every single step in the supply chain, which I'm sure gives you an amazing perspective of how things are done and then also how mm. things should be done, right? Because it's different to kind of, as a consultant myself, it's completely different to do things than just to kind of try to understand things without doing and then trying to bring uh, some recommendations to the table. So Matt, in those early years and kind of going through the UPS career that you had, which is amazing, what do you think were the three most uh, important characteristics or aspects that you consider important for for success in a company uh, as, as, I guess, open and, and uh, innovative as, as UPS. What, what do you think uh, was key for you to, to progress from when you, where you started to where you are now? Yeah, I, I think um, you know, business values uh, um, are kind of, you know, sometimes a little hard to define and, and, and sometimes uh, not easy to, to, to uh, get, understand the tangible benefit of that. But having values is, is critical and those values uh, uh, generally are centered around two things. One is, is people and customers. Yeah, the people, we talked about people being the brand, but uh, the other aspects of the people uh, um, that are so important is to get ideas from the bottom up on how to improve because they're the ones closest to doing the job. Right. Having a, a culture of progression where there's uh uh, there is avenues for promote from within. There is avenues to grow a career within an organization. I think is very important. Uh, you know, diversity is so important for so many reasons. Uh, uh, one of those reasons is is uh, 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 different perspectives and different backgrounds and different thoughts. Uh, I've always found the best leadership teams have the right mix of outside perspectives from the industry, maybe even outside perspectives not from the industry. And then homegrown uh, uh, women and men that have an understanding of the core processes and, and the core cultures of, of, of an entity. No, so thank you once again. And there you guys have it, right? So it's no secret recipe, I guess. It's, you mentioned values. You mentioned a culture that allows progression and avenues to grow for everyone that starts and works for that company. Uh, you mentioned people. You mentioned ideas. Customers listen. Listen, it's very important. Listen to everyone in the organization, not only like uh, the top levels. And of course, diversity, which is all these things that are were important back then when you started. And I feel that they're incredibly critical and maybe even more important now. Yeah, you, you know, to touch on, I'll touch on customer here in a sec, because that's the other, the other thing that's uh, huge for focus. But, you know, what's encouraging that I'm seeing in diversity is, is, and this, you know, obviously was from the tragic events of last summer, is, is you know, companies, my, in my opinion, always had good intent, good, good intentions in regards to growing diversity uh, within their workforce or within their supplier base, but they, they either did not understand or, you know, weren't willing to kind of 
uh, uh, modify processes or, or enhance processes to, to create an outcome that they, they want. And I think yeah. that's really neat. I'm seeing that uh, uh, on a number of levels where companies, and a lot of them are great, are great donor partners, they're, they're, they're doing things differently, whether that is how they vet suppliers, whether that's how they attract talent, whether they, how they groom talent. Uh, you know, actually, interesting enough, us being uh, Atlanta, Georgia uh, uh, guys uh, that we're very proud of our city is there was an article in the Wall Street Journal last weekend uh, talking about how big tech companies and, and non-tech companies are moving either to Atlanta or setting up significant operations in Atlanta due to the large percentage of African-Americans, the, uh, you know, I think there's four HBCU uh, um, schools in the Atlanta area. So that, that's a case, that's, that's, it's an example of doing things differently. And so as opposed to Google or, or, or Silicon Valley company trying to improve their diversity in their workforce with Silicon Valley only having 2% African-Americans in the community, right. you're only gonna be so successful. So, you know, let's set up an operation in Atlanta where there's a, you know, there's a diverse educated workforce. Let's bring, let's bring the work to where the, 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 the talent is versus trying to find talent in an area where there's just not much quantity. That's an example of that. But uh, also, uh, you know, I've got, uh, as time goes on, an increasing appreciation of the, the value of being customer centric. And uh, at Good 360, our, our North Star is that for every nonprofit, which there's 90,000 of them in our network, and I know we're going to wow. talk about that with Kevin, that every nonprofit that does a transaction with Good 360, they feel they got tremendous value from that engagement. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we're, working toward a, a culture where people are empowered, all of our people are empowered to kind of make it right. If uh, they received a shipment from Good360, that might've been you know, not the bill of laden that they were expecting, or if the goods got damaged, you know, we want to uh, you know, refund them you know, the, 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 the transaction fee or the shipping and handling and or send them the next one free or both, right? So Matt, you're not telling us that sometimes things go wrong in the world of logistics. Is that what you're telling us? <laughs> I'm not in this industry, no. Uh -oh. Sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> it's a full contact sport as you gentlemen know. And I always, I always like the Mike Tyson line, right? That everybody has a plan to get punched in the face, right? We, we, we chuckle with that saying now and then here at uh, Good360 and, and uh, at UPS, I, I certainly did as well. That could be a good um, episode title, Scott, right there. <laughs> the, the classical philosopher. The classical Mike philosopher Tyson. that Matt yeah. just scored it again. And no, I, I, uh, when you were talking about all this, I kind of got a flashback from my grandmother in Mexico. And of course, I'm going to try to translate this. But she always said to us that uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions or something like that. So you're right. People and companies usually in general have good intentions. But we are going to deep dive into good 360 because that's it's it's a it's a big stretch going from like a good intention to actually becoming a pers purpose driven company and and you guys have it and and you've been doing it for a while and i think that kind of reflects the amazing school that ups has been for you and some other people that have come out of ups and and, and we'll deep dive into that one a couple of two more questions on your professional career uh, the first one is just one big eureka moment that you've had like throughout your extensive career in supply chain and uh, just one moment that, or one example that you think, well, this basically shift my thinking towards, because uh, you moved from the corporate world to, to the leading uh, an organization like Good360. What was, what was there that kind of made you make that decision? Yeah, I think the, 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 the Eureka uh, uh, decision when I, when I transitioned from the commercial world to nonprofit was how uh, uh, challenging managing a nonprofit is. Uh, um, uh, a nonprofit should be titled not for loss. Uh, yeah. Nonprofits don't have access to equity markets. You know, it's not like you know, Scott and I have a great idea. Uh, we're going to burn through cash for the next 18 months. And so we can get you and Kevin to jump on board. We dilute. You guys bring in the equity money to for us to get to where we want to be. You don't have that option in a nonprofit. There's not many banks, if any banks, willing to lend money to a nonprofit that doesn't have positive operating leverage. So 
yeah, that was kind of a big eureka moment for me with, you know, with, with running a nonprofit, you're really operating without a net. So you got to be able to create that safety net because you need to have the reserves to do three things. One is, is to handle rainy days. Uh, uh, two is, is to have working capital to be able to make strategic decisions uh, quickly without uh, having to, uh, uh, um, you know, do two things. One is say, hey, is this a good investment? And then secondly, you know, how are we going to pay for it, right? You, if you can eliminate that, that, that can make your company uh, um, a lot nimbler and, and uh, successful faster. And, and uh, you know, the, the third is, is uh, you know, having uh, the ability to invest in your model you know, and, and invest in you know, people, IT, technology, infrastructure, et cetera, uh, that how hard it was uh, or how different it is. Right. Uh, for a nonprofit, and and the other is is uh, you know managing key constituents. Uh, uh, if you're a board member for a commercial entity, you're representing investors. Uh, uh, if you're a board member for a nonprofit, you're representing donors in some way, shape, or form. And and the expectations of donors are higher because they're, they're giving you either money or product. In our case, with the expectations of an outcome of impact. Uh, for investors, they know that hey, I'm in. I'm investing money, but I could lose it to, to make more money, right? And so, right. so I believe the stakes are a little higher, both from the uh, uh, governance perspective, but uh, you need to operate a little differently uh, uh, from a commercial perspective to, uh, you know, make sure that you have the, the financial foundation and underpinnings to, uh, to, to increase your value and impact. And, and I believe you kind of jumped from uh, UPS because you were at the board of uh, Good 360, right? Is that kind of like your the, the stepping kind of stone? How did you get from one to the other company? Yeah. And, and why? Why would you do that? Well, Enrique, that's a, it's great. You've done, you've done your homework and uh, <laughs> you're not surprised with venture logistics. Uh, but anyways, uh, you know, it, it, uh, I got involved with the nonprofit space about 10 years ago with uh, uh, Eduardo Martinez, who's the president of the UPS Foundation. He had tremendous vision on where he wanted the foundation to go, which included having a larger in-kind presence uh, in the nonprofit community. And for UPS, of course, in-kind is, is logistics and supply chain. Uh, he didn't have those operating capabilities within the foundation. So uh, he worked closely with myself and I leveraged my working groups and operational teams to provide uh, solutions and execution for uh, uh, um, disaster recovery relief. And that could have been pre-positioning bottled water uh, for uh, a hurricane uh, domestically, or it could have been consolidating 75 metric tons of plumpy sump in Europe to airlift it to the Sahel of Africa. So I, I got exposed to the NGO world through working closely with Ed, I got excited about it. I got an understanding, as you do, Enrique, of how important logistics is to disaster recovery, to distribution of needed goods and services uh, uh, to our most under-resourced uh, uh, people in the world, and getting an understanding of the, the, the structure of the UN cluster, you know, the World Food Program, uh, uh, UNICEF Supply Division, UNHCR, which uh, we can talk about a little later. But uh, uh, so that gave me the opportunity to serve on boards, including Good360. Uh, and uh, the board uh, is an excellent board. I think uh, the quality of a board is so important for any nonprofit, not only to provide governance and compliance, but to provide the strategic direction. And Good360 has been uh, been, been uh, you know, um, you know, privileged to have a fantastic board of, of different skill sets that built up operating capabilities that made Good360 very relevant during the uh, the pandemic. Thank you. And um, Kevin, go ahead. I feel like I'm kind of hogging the conversation with Matt here. So, uh, so all yours. And thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Matt, uh, once again. Yeah, Matt. Well, again, welcome in. We really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you. It's interesting as you talk about your career at UPS and and as I started my career in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, we called uh, what we call supply chain today, you know, we called it shipping or transportation or traffic. 
And then over the last 25 years or so, it's turned into logistics, now supply chain. But really, at the end of the day, we're doing one of two things. We're picking up and we're dropping it off. Now, we really there's a lot of complexities now and from A to B, but ultimately, that's what we do. So it's interesting uh, to hear your story and where we go from logistics. But, you know, really what we're here to do is to also talk about what Good360 actually does to help those around the world, those in need. So if you would... And a couple of minutes ago, Scott had alluded to, we're gonna talk about pur purposeful giving. Why is that important when it talk, when it's your organization and your customers, or we'll call it your, your partners. We're gonna talk about partners again in a couple of minutes, but really from a high level, then drill down, what does Good360 actually do? And then keeping in mind purposeful giving from your perspective and your client's perspective. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, Good360 is a, is a key, fulcrum that will become more relevant to help address the needs gap. Uh, uh, specifically, Good360 provides cost-effective and responsible solutions for companies' excess product in their supply chains, and we distribute that product to a network of 90,000 fed charities. And this has been going on from your organization for 37 plus years. And, and Scott gave us all the numbers and everything and the overall impact what do you see as the biggest impact since the time that you've been there? What is the largest impact that you've seen that you've actually had your hands on where you have where you have made a difference or your organization has made a significant difference? Is it during COVID or is it? Yeah, you know, it, it's, well, as far as me making a difference, uh, I, you know, there's nothing there. You know, we're a team yeah, here at Good360 and, and uh, Good360 has uh, really uh, been a... Uh, you know, a, a, a key uh, a component to distribute needed goods during COVID. Uh, to give a context, Kevin, in 2019, uh, Good360 distributed $330 million of donated product. Last year was over 700 million. And this year we're on pace to be over a billion dollars. Uh, the reason being is, is uh, Good360, you know, with the board's leadership and the phenomenal uh, management team we have here, which, is the best I've worked with, no offense, UPS partners, but uh, is uh, they built operating capabilities that were really relevant for when COVID hit. Uh, you know, when COVID hit, uh, there was spring launch, there was winter launches that didn't fully sell. There was spring launches that didn't go at all. Uh, there was massive uh, 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 flux between what flowed through the brick and mortar network and what throw, flowed through a dot com. Um, companies in the omni-channel space that have both, which most of our donors have. Uh, so they have different supply chains for both. They, you know, they leverage both networks and they have synergies between the network. But, uh, you know, with the shutdown, the retail brick and mortar supply chain evaporated while the e-commerce exploded, right? And, you know, that created a lot of disruption and, and we were able to provide, a, you know, significant value to the donors to uh, absorb their product and then distribute that effectively to people that could do the most good with it. Uh, the value, Kevin, our donors get is they get compliance. Uh, when they give us the product, they get uh, assurance that that product's not gonna wind up on Craigslist or a flea market or some secondary market to dilute their brand. Right. Uh, They're eligible for an enhanced tax write-off. Uh, and then uh, what we've really, um, increasing our, our competency on and ability to do is provide the donor uh, two things. One is, is impact stories that they share on their internal comm sites, uh, but also provide them key metrics, both for sustainability goals of what product was kept out of a landfill and or did not have to be transported back to a return center or a fulfillment center to be put back on a marketplace. Uh, uh, and um, the, the, uh, the other is, is being more cause specific. We've invested heavily in a CRM where we have strong definition of what our 90,000 nonprofits focus on, whether that is indigenous people causes, whether that is uh, racial justice issues, whether that is homeless veteran issues, that we're getting better at targeting uh, the impact. Uh, we also, uh, 
have strong capabilities. And this is how the UPS relationship started with Good360 back 15 years ago uh, around disaster recovery, which we can uh, talk about, Kevin, if we have time. Okay, good deal. So, you know, COVID has played a, a critical, it's been an impact that we never saw coming, but there is a silver lining for everything. And with that silver lining, if you can find one with COVID, has been the ability for people to become more humane, to open up their hearts and their eyes for what is going on in different parts of the world and how we can make a difference. So uh, we truly appreciate everything that you do at, at Good Through 60. And, you know, over the last few minutes, we've talked about 90,000 plus nonprofits. You know, in order to have those 90,000 nonprofits, you also have corporate partnerships that are critical to the day-to-day -day running of your organization and, and how you make it better for the rest of the world. Companies like Nike, uh, UPS, Walmart, Amazon, Vance Auto, Tipper, Tipper Seeley. So there's a lot of different organizations that are making a significant difference so that those 90,000 can make a difference. So if you could, tell us about some of the recent partnerships and uh, we'll talk about the NFL here in just a moment, but talk to us about your corporate partnerships and then the other 90,000 plus. Yeah, great. Um, two, uh, two partnerships that I think are, 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 uh, are germane um, around COVID relief. Uh, one is with uh, Garnet Hill, which is a really cool company based out of Exeter, New Hampshire, my, my old neck of the woods up in New England, where they committed to provide $10 to Good360 for every cotton mask that they sold on their website. Uh, this resulted in a tremendous impact because what Good360 can do is we can commit to at least 10x of product of impact for every dollar given. So with this partnership with Garnet Hill, we've been able to provide $250,000 in product to people in need during the pandemic. And just a really cool progressive company and a great initiative to uh, you know, collaborate for uh, you know, the greater good. Uh, the, other during, uh, the other initiative during COVID, which really will always stick with me and resonates with me is uh, uh, working with Nike. Uh, Nike, uh, we partnered with them to deliver 30,000 Nike Zoom Pulse shoes. And um, I was not aware of how good these shoes are until uh, this initiative, but these, these, are, these shoes are just incredibly well designed. And as you know, Kevin, you know, healthcare workers uh, were, were our heroes you know, um, uh, um, right from the jump and continue to be today as we look to all get vaccinated. Uh, they, uh, we delivered 5,000 pairs of shoes to hospitals in Chicago, Los Angeles, Memphis, and New York City. And uh, those men and women that were putting long hours in in emergency rooms and uh, uh, ICU units, uh, you know, at least they had the, the best in class footwear out there to keep them comfortable. In addition, Nike uh, also gave 5,000 pairs of uh, air pulse zooms to uh, military healthcare workers in the Veterans Health Administration Network and uh, uh, coupled with those shoes in those cities into the uh, VHA, uh, we also uh, distributed 95,000 pairs of Nike soccer uh, socks that were high uh, compression socks, which helped the blood flow of people that are on their feet today doing the critical work trying to, uh, to uh, uh, help people in need. And then as far as a non-COVID, uh, program that is, I think is really special is what we have with Advance Auto. Uh, Advance Auto uh, merged with CarQuest a number of years ago. They're a fantastic organization down in North Carolina. Uh, they uh, uh, um, distribute, they, they provide, I think it's 54 DCs that we uh, uh, move product, excess product from Advance Auto to a network of nonprofits that specialize on two things. One is is, trade, is training the next generation of auto mechanics. Uh, a lot of these entities are giving at-risk youth, mostly young men, uh, a chance to learn a, a vocation and a skill. And these goods that uh, Advanced Auto provides helps that mission. And also Advanced Auto supplies and parts goes to nonprofits that specialize on providing low cost trans transportation repair to people that are in need of transportation to get to work and, and without providing it at low cost would not be able to do it. So those, those are three that are, you know, that, that, that come to mind and uh, that, are, that are personal. 
Well, and I'm sure if we had the time, you could go on and on and on and probably touch something on all 90,000. They all make a difference. And uh, so we appreciate the, the partnership that you have with Nike and, and what they've done for our heroes and our uh, frontline workers yeah. during this horrible pandemic. So uh, last question I really have for you, and, and this is something I, that I've seen has been floated on the internet. It's really an interesting story is your relationship with the NFL. I think we're all just about everybody in America has some type of an affiliation with the team. I'm a, an Atlanta Falcon and a Dallas Cowboy, uh, but we all have that affiliation. Tell us about your affiliation with the NFL. Yeah, the, the affiliation, the partnership with the NFL, I think has gone on for about eight years. If it's not eight years and it's, it's, it's seven, but I'm pretty sure it's eight years. Uh, and uh, the relationship actually came through Nike. Um, but the NFL being, um, you know, the global – brand that they are, which is, uh, you know, uh, you know, philanthropic at the heart. Uh, they, uh, they, they did not want to throw out merchandise, uh, merchandise that would be thrown out after a big game, specifically conference championship games in the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, those purchases as, uh, you know, from being good sports fans are, are one of impulse, right? So you need to have the product available on deck, literally minutes after the victory. Yeah. Uh, you know, this year, Tampa Bay, right. I mean, minutes after, uh, 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 you know, Tampa Bay won, people, uh, the majority of those purchases are probably done within 24 hours. Yeah. Right. Not 24 than 48. So, so to fulfill those, you need to have product on order. And so the team that came up a little short, either in the conference championship or the Super Bowl, uh, that product is uh, uh, um, the NFL didn't want to throw out. So we work uh, collaboratively with them and we work and do a lot of research globally for nonprofits and under-resourced parts of the world where this product will do a couple things. One is, is raise someone's dignity. Uh, um, we wanna make sure that uh, you know, where it goes, they, the, the folks might not know who won the Super Bowl because you know, we don't want them thinking they're wearing quote unquote a loser's shirt. Uh, and secondarily is we're very cognizant of not to disrupt the local economy. We don't want to provide, let's pick a number, you know, uh, um, 2,000 t-shirts in an economy and knock out textile manufacturers or textile retailers. So we work very deliberately to make sure that we're not disruptive to the local economy on that. But a great partnership with the NHL, with the NFL. Uh, we also have uh, a similar partnership with uh, Major League Baseball, which uh -huh similar and and also very uh, constructive very good matt we appreciate your time today last thing i have is you know there's a lot of potential listeners out there uh listening to us today if they want to support your mission if they want to work with you collaborate with you how's the best way they can do that whether it be an organization or individuals or what what is your thought process on that yeah great yeah, well anyways good360.org yeah it's a pretty uh, um, it's a pretty uh, uh, user-friendly website uh, for nonprofits that are looking to get access to our product uh, that we provide either at the carton level through our e-commerce site or LTL or truckload level if they're approved to receive those larger quantities. It's free to join our network. Um, the vetting process is usually done within 24 hours if they have a, a 501c3 EIN number. It yeah. might take a little longer if not. Uh, but, uh, you know, please join our network if you're in the nonprofit space. And if you're a donor looking for those solutions, uh, certainly there's, there's access to providing engagement with Good360 through our website, but also feel free to reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. Matt, again, thank you. Scott, turn this back over to you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, gosh, I feel like I've gotten a business education and a, a nonprofit education all in the same 60-minute uh, session. So I want to wrap with just a couple of additional questions. Uh, um, Matt, you're a walking encyclopedia uh, for so many different things, and, and whether it's sports or business or leadership or kind of the, uh, the evolution of supply chain or, of course, the great need that's out there that Good 360 serves that unfortunately is probably in a blind spot for so many certainly Americans and, and many others. So it's, it's neat to have you on and, and, and share some of the great work you're doing. Um, let's go broader uh, as we start to wrap up here. You know, we've touched on so much as part of this discussion, but when you think of global business, and I think you mentioned that 
you know, the world is certainly a, a much tighter community these days. The information age does a good job there. What's one thing maybe we haven't touched on that you're tracking as a, you know, as a business leader right now? Yeah, the two things that uh, we're watching closely is um, logistics cost. Yeah, as uh, Enrique and Kevin know, the cost of transportation uh, is uh, is escalating for a number of reasons. I think we've seen the price of oil go up off of record lows recently. Uh, the price of building facilities is a lot more expensive. I think to construct a new DC or warehouse, you know, steel alone is probably 50% higher now than it was last year. Uh, so we're really uh, looking at ways to bend the cost curve of uh, movement of goods because uh, our constituents, which are nonprofits, aren't, they're the most vulnerable during an inflationary period, which we could be in with almost $2 trillion of new money cycling through the economy that uh, they're not able to pass on added expense to their constituents, which are our most needy and vulnerable, right? So, so what uh, the, the business dynamic that we have, that we're really watching about, watching and, and, and uh, are, are looking to manage effectively to be seamless to our, our nonprofit constituents is how to manage a potential inflationary environment in aggregate, and certainly an inflationary environment around logistics in supply chain, and that is both cost of labor, you know, compliance, building a facility, uh, uh, and then moving it, whether it be over the road or, or by rail or by air or ocean. Uh, I think uh, all you gentlemen know that air and ocean freight rates uh, have skyrocketed in the past 12 months. So how to manage that in a way uh, 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 to uh, uh, support our nonprofits that don't have the ability to pass on those costs to their, their constituents. Which, uh, oh, sorry about that. Enrique. No, no, I just wanted to comment something quickly on what you just said. I mean, those extra charges and extra costs that are kind of really, really putting a lot of pressure on uh, on everyone's supply chain for, for this organization. So for this people, the, the end customers, the people that are really benefiting from what you're sending, it's critical, right? To your point earlier, it's just not, we're not moving containers. We're just shipping hope and, uh, and medicines. And so if, if, they cannot ship it, then someone will be very impacted more than just simply by paying more. I mean, there's a lot more at stake, as you mentioned. Yeah, and, and maybe if, if, if I may, Scott, to add on a little bit of a fun kind of triangulation with Enrique and Kevin is, is uh, working with USA UNHCR. Uh, uh, we're uh, partnered with USA UNHCR and Gap Brands to send new clothing abroad uh, that includes segmenting it, uh, scanning it, bailing it, and uh, coming up with cost-effective ocean solutions to different parts of the world, including Western Africa, Eastern Africa, and the Middle East. And and uh, you know, working with venture logistics, we're able to come up with new, fresh ideas to to help you know, mitigate or bend that cost curve around increased shipping cost. And, and, and we all know that ocean freight costs have uh, gone up quite a bit, as I mentioned. Yeah, as we sit here today, speaking of ocean shipping, and of course, we're hoping that it's, it's cleared long before when this episode publishes, but to see what's going on in the Suez Canal, uh, that just adds to these all these headaches that's adding the complexities and costs and, and a lot more. So uh, intriguing times we live in in the supply chain world right now. But I want to go back. So I, I, we're going to wrap on two things here. And folks, we want to encourage you to go to th uh, good 360.org y'all check that out there's a lot more information there that matt's been speaking about including ways you can get involved and help uh further an admission uh so two quick things i want to go back to uh i didn't realize in my homework that you started as a ups driver you know you, you mentioned a front line and and you know whether you're healthcare or retail or supply chain or you name it folks that are in those frontline roles man so many brave stories uh, of, of people that went to work, pandemic or no pandemic, to make it happen, to protect the rest of us. And there's so much good news that comes out of that. What's one thing, you know, we've seen stories where communities have thrown surprise parties for their hardworking, longworking uh, delivery drivers, right? Because e-commerce has been helping everybody get what they need, amongst other things. But what's one thing that maybe most listeners may not appreciate or know about those hardworking delivery drivers? 
Yeah, the, the one thing that they they need to know is is that yeah you know, these folks early on right when there was a lot of mystery about the virus right and, and uncertainty about the virus and uh, you know they uh, for the greater good right they they went into work and uh, you know healthcare workers supermarket workers uh, um, every person on, on my team knows to thank their delivery driver, whether it's USPS, Amazon, UPS, or FedEx, uh, to thank those drivers. But early on is, uh, you know, when we really didn't have a, a clear understanding of the depths of the virus, which were, were significant, as we found out, you know, they, uh, they went out there, right? They, they didn't have the opportunity to work in a virtual environment. Uh, we know this firsthand because we, uh, we move stuff. We, we move cartons, and we move LTL volume, we move TL volume, that uh, we uh, are so appreciative at Good360 of our team in Omaha. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, um, a core of Good360 folks, uh, leadership in, in, in Omaha that manage all the carton movement mm. and some LTL movement uh, for Good360. And uh, that team, uh, without question, you know, went in there every day uh, and, and implemented you know, safety protocols. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate that uh, we are partnered with great companies like UPS, Amazon, and, and Walmart, where we were able to glean best practices in yep. regard to facing and, and contract tracing and protocol for entering. But, uh, I, I, Scott, I think it's a great way to end it is, is the humility of the people that uh, kept our supply chains going, kept food on our, uh, on our supermarket shelves, you know, food on our table and, uh, and we're there to service the people that, uh, uh, you know, contracted the virus. So well done, Scott. Well said, uh, got to thank a driver. And when we can get closer together, you got to hug on those drivers and love on those drivers. They're, they're vital, vital components, uh, as, as, as is all those other frontline workers that Matt alluded to. All right, we're going to wrap on the billion dollar question. So as I survey over at ESPN.com, I've learned that the Red Sox beat my beloved Braves yesterday in spring training. <laughs> they're at a, a record of 12 and eight. Uh, Garrett Richards beat Mr. Yanoa for the Braves. So what is your break out your crystal ball as we wrap here? What is your prediction for the Red Sox in 2021? Well, I, I think 2021 is going to be a rebuilding year because it's a very tough division with the, uh, the Yankees. And, uh, and especially if they make it regional where the, you throw the Phillies in and uh, you know, the Mets in are going to be both improved. If, if they go that way, if they go the, the old National League East, where the uh, the Braves are playing, the you know the Phillies and the Mets might be a different story. But I, I, I'm more. Uh, I, I think the your Atlanta Braves are have a have a better brighter outlook than my Red Sox this year. But I'll still be rooting for the Red Sox, win, lose, or draw. That's how well, it goes. I love that, and and again, that makes the better years exciting. And it's 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 really amazing what the Red Sox have been able to do once they got past that curse, and then they just set set baseball on fire. So we'll see what happens. Uh, but a pleasure and an honor to sit down with you. Thanks so much, Matt Connolly and, and, and the great people, the great people over at Good360 uh, and check them out at good360.org. Big thanks as well, of course, to Enrique Alvarez, Kevin Brown with Vector Global Logistics. And the conversations like this is what makes this series so rewarding. Am I right? Absolutely. Understood. Thank you so much, Matt. This is, uh, you would really... You didn't really mention the other service that you provide, but just inspiring other companies like mine. I mean, we look up to, to you and organizations like yours, and I think that's something that's incredibly important, especially this day. So uh, thank you so much. Yeah, after a, year, after a year of global unrest, it gives us uh, a lot of optimism when I uh, talk to people like you, Enrique. And Scott, thank you for the opportunity today. You thank bet. You. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Kevin Brown, Enrique Alvarez with Vector Global Logistics, Matt Connolly, CEO of Good360. To our listeners, hey, hopefully you all enjoyed this conversation as much as, as we have here. What an incredible organization doing good. Really, um, deeds, not words, is what it comes to my mind. So uh, with all that said, hopefully this finds you well wherever you are. On behalf of our entire team here at Supply Chain Now, hey, do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. 